Hi class, welcome to the first video lecture for lecture number nine. This lecture is going to focus on bacterial genetics. Um, I believe that this, yeah, this, um, the textbook chapter that we're going to refer to during this lecture is mostly chapter eight, as you can see in the Nestor text. And here, um, be sure to review all of the learning objectives prior to um, uh, continuing on with this video. So let's talk a little bit about bacterial genetics. Let's talk about genetics in general and then talk about bacterial genetics specifically. So here I have a little, this, I used to have this on the front page um, or the front first slide of the, of the lecture, but I just put it over here because I was talking, this is a slide that I want to talk about genetics. And of course, this is the famous um, father of genetics, Gregor Mendel. Um, and I have an X over his, <laughs> over his picture, not because I don't like him. I actually like him uh, quite a bit. He's, um, he's actually a really interesting figure in, in science. Um, because of his of his story, he has a very in in my opinion, I think he has a very interesting story. He came from very humble, uh, very humble beginnings. He was the son of farmers, and he wasn't. He was very he was very poor, and he went and he joined. The, a lot of people think of him as a religious figure because he was a monk and he lived his life in a monastery. But the reason that he lived in a monastery is because that was really the only means that he had to support himself and continue on with his math and science um, research. So he couldn't, he didn't, he couldn't afford to go to university and he couldn't find a sponsor, which at the time in, um, where did he live? He lived in what is modern day Czech Republic, but I think at that time it was the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And during those times, the only way to go to university was if your family was wealthy enough or if you were able to find someone to sponsor you to go. And he wasn't able to do that despite being very, very intelligent and a great mathematician, he was unable to find sponsorship. So he joined the monastery um, with the hopes that basically he could be left alone to do his experiments, <laughs> which I think is kind of interesting. The other thing that is really cool about Gregor Mendel is that he basically did all of his science experiments in complete obscurity. And he, um, he corresponded with different scientists at the time, but his work was basically not respected during his lifetime. He died, he did his experiments in the early 1860s, I believe, died in the 1880s. And it wasn't until really the early 20th century that people began to realize what exactly he did and the brilliance of his experiments. And of course he did the famous pea plant experiment where he showed that, um, um, organisms get two alleles, one from mom and one from dad, or one from a female and a donor, one from a male donor. And the interplay between these two alleles can determine the phenotype of that organism. And so this brings me to the reason, of course, that I put this X over his face is because we can't discuss, we can't have those Mendelian genetic ideas in our mind when we talk about bacteria, because bacteria, of course, don't reproduce through sexual means. They only reproduce through binary fission. So this idea that we have two alleles and we have to talk about dominance and homozygous versus heterozygous is, is just out the window. That doesn't work with bacteria. There's really only two ways that bacteria can change at the genetic level. There's two processes. One is, of course, horizontal gene transfer and the other is vertical gene transfer. So take a look at these two pictures and ask yourself which one represents vertical gene transfer and which one represents vert uh, vertical gene transfer. So the first one, this top picture is vertical gene transfer. So if we have a parent bacteria and we have two, two daughter cells here, if there is a spontaneous mutation in the gene, like say for example, uh, DNA polymerase three makes a mistake, a nucleotide insertion, deletion, or substitution during the replication process and doesn't catch it, we can have a spontaneous mutation arise in that daughter cell. So this would be considered a vertical gene transfer because the way that the DNA is being transferred is in a vertical fashion from parent to, in this case, from parent to offspring. On the other hand, this bottom picture represents vertical gene transfer in which one bacteria, say the one on the left, is going to share genetic material with the bacteria on the right. And they do this through, the through um, in this particular case, they're sharing a small circular piece of DNA that's called a, a plasmid. So a plasmid is a small circular piece of DNA that's contained within a bacteria. And sometimes it's shown that these bacteria can actually share these with one another. Imagine 
Imagine how cool that would be if we could do that with each other, right? You see someone that have beautiful curly hair, say, for example, and you say, oh, I love your hair. And they say, here, here's the gene for it. And you take it. And now you have that beautiful curly hair too. That'd be pretty cool, wouldn't it? Uh, so bacteria can do this. And um, it's, it's really uh, an amazing feat. And it's a way of introducing genetic variation within a population. Because remember, there, other than other than these two methods of introducing genetic variation, this is it. This is there's no other way for bacteria to kind of scramble their genes or um, compensate for genetic variation so that they can adapt to their environment um, and better survive. So these are the two main methods of um, of uh, introducing genetic variation: horizontal gene transfer and vertical gene transfer. So I want to talk a little bit about some uh, vocabulary terms before we get started on the various ways of introducing genetic changes to bacteria. And the first one I want to talk about is recombination and recombinant. So recombination is the process of taking either genes or DNA from two different sources that result in a change chromosome. So in, in eukaryotes, this is really what happens, um, for example, like during uh, meiosis in, um, what would that be? Let me think, let me think. Prophase one, uh, when the tetrads form, the, um, the uh, homologous chromosomes kind of pair up with one another and they do, they have this event called crossing over where they can kind of switch pieces of DNA with one another. And that process, of course, is reciprocal. In other words, they're exchanging. If I, it's um, um, kind of like you have a, um, uh, how would I say this? Um, well, it's, it's a true exchange, right? It's not just a donor and a recipient. Each person or each, in this case, chromosome in this process is getting something in exchange. So they're really just exchanging information in the form of DNA rather than one person giving and one person taking. Whereas in prokaryotes and bacteria, this is really a non-reciprocal process. In other words, one bacteria is either going... To, one bacteria is going to accept DNA that started somewhere else, either um, in a donor cell or DNA that is floating around the environment from dead bacteria or from a virus and so on. So it's not a reciprocal process like we see in eukaryotic organisms. So finally, when we have this cell that receives that DNA, that information, that recipient cell, we're going to call that bacteria now a recombinant because this is a bacteria or um, uh, it's a bacteria that contains a chromosome that now has new information in it. It has undergone recombination and has new genetic material. So we would now call that new bacteria, or I should say that, that bacteria that has the new information of recombinant bacteria and has a recombinant chromosome. So a couple more vocabulary terms. This is outlined in section 8.1 of your textbook. Uh, we want to differentiate between a prototroph and an oxytroph. So these are these are terms that will become important when we talk about the experiments that show um, show these mechanisms in action. A prototroph is we've actually worked with prototrophs before. Pro prototrophs are bacteria that don't require supplemental growth nutrients. Perfect example of this is E. coli. If you recall. When we did the experiment on nutritional supplement, or what was it called? Um, meat culture media. We compared we compared glucose salts to nutrient broth to brain heart infusion. And if you recall, glucose salts broth has only one source of carbon in glucose and one source of nitrogen in ammonium salt. It had no macromolecules of any kind. It had no amino acids, no lipids, no uh, nucleic acids, and so on. And E. coli was able to grow in that glucose salt broth pretty well because E. coli is a prototroph. In other words, it has all the enzymes, it has all those anabolic enzymes that it could need to be able to metabolize anything that it requires for growth. So we call E. coli, wild type E. coli anyway, a prototroph because it can pretty much grow in in, in the bare minimum type of media and doesn't need any type of supplementation in order to grow. So um, how would we say non-fastidious, right? Bacteria that are very, very non-fastidious like E. coli are prototrophs. On the other hand, we can have bacteria that are oxytrophs. They need some type of supplementation in their, um, in their media to supplement nutrients that they can't make themselves. So for, an exa for example, if we were to take this E. coli bacteria, if we were to take this E. coli and 
mutate its DNA somewhere, like hit it with some ionizing radiation, some UV, or a chemical mutagen such that we damage some of its genes. For example, we could damage or delete the gene that builds tryptophan. Remember, tryptophan is an essential amino acid. And if this, um, if this E. coli is no longer able to make tryptophan, we would, have to tr we would have to supplement tryptophan in that media in order for E. coli to grow. E. coli would no longer be able to grow in glucose salts. It would die because it can't make tryptophan. So we would call this E. coli, this kind of mutated E. coli, an oxytroph that's trip negative, tryptophan negative, because it can no longer make tryptophan. Now, on the other hand, instead of harming or deleting genes like we did here in the oxytroph example, we can actually add genes. So we can introduce new genes to a bacteria. And if we, do, if we add a gene that codes for a mechanism of antibiotic resistance, for example, we could add a gene that codes for an enzyme that breaks down um, what's STR, strep, probably streptomycin. So if we, if we have a gene that codes for an enzyme that breaks down streptomycin, for example, we can introduce this gene to the bacteria. This bacteria is now considered a recombinant because it has new information, it has new DNA in it, and that bacteria is now considered streptomycin resistant. So we now have a resistant bacteria that we can plate onto media that contains the antibiotic streptomycin, and um, it would be able to grow because it's resistant to streptomycin. All right, so in this lecture, I'll probably, in this first video, I'll probably just cover the first one. I'm trying to chop these videos up into smaller pieces so you guys aren't, uh, one, so it doesn't take forever to upload to uh, YouTube, and two, so that you can kind of digest these a little bit easier. But the first one that I'm going to go over tonight is transformation um, of, um, of bacteria, but you can see that um, in this uh, lecture, we're going to go over really three major types of genetic recombination, transformation, transduction, and then two different variations on conjugation. So let's talk about transformation first. So before we talk about transformation, let's take a step back and remind ourselves what is more pathogenic, bacteria with a capsule and bacteria without a capsule. So which of those two are more pathogenic and why? See if you can remember when we talked about this way back in the beginning of the semester. <clears throat> So of course, uh, hopefully you remember that bacteria with a capsule are, are not only more pathogenic, but really bacteria without a capsule don't stand a chance. If you were to take a swab of the bacteria in your mouth, for example, all of those bacteria have a capsule on them because unencapsulated bacteria really can't survive in an animal that has an immune system. And we'll learn all about this in unit four. Our immune system is so good that it will just take care, it'll just gobble up any bacteria that doesn't have any type of protective um, coating around it. And so it, a, a capsule, as you can see in this um, capsule stain here by all of these um, uh, bacteria have a nice thick capsule surrounding them. Uh, these capsules make them slippery. They can evade phagocytosis and they also help in adherence. They can help like if we have, again, like take our mouth, for example, these capsules help the bacteria stick to our teeth and get kind of in our gum line and so on. And it's a huge survival mechanism and a pathogenicity factor for bacteria in, um, in, in the wild, right, in nature. So in, in a human or in a mouse model, for example, you would never really find unencapsulated bacteria surviving um, with very few exceptions, of course, um, outside of unencapsulated or outside of being having a capsule. <clears throat> so let's talk about this really famous experiment that um, Frederick, Frederick Griffith did in the early, uh, early 20th century. So he did this in the 20s, which remember, this was still before we even knew what DNA was and before and when there was still a lot of controversy over whether or not DNA. Uh, or what was the molecule of inheritance? Again, at this time, most people thought that it was proteins. And um, there was this very small um, group of scientists that thought that it was actually DNA. So, <clears throat> sorry, my phone keeps blowing. I feel like every time, I swear, no one, no one, no one emails me or texts me all day until I start to lecture and then I get all these text messages. Okay, so um, what we're gonna do here is we're going to look at 
how um, ultimately how DNA is taken up by by bacterial cells. So let's look at this experiment first. Let me set it up for you and we'll walk through this together. So he took a, a strain of bacteria called Streptococcus, Strepto, oh, Streptococcus, S pneumoniae, Streptococcus pneumoniae, and he had two different strains of this type of bacteria. He had a strain called 3S that had a capsule on it. So the S actually stands for smooth. So they're these bacteria right here. So they're alive and they have a capsule and they're very pathogenic. So when he injected these into a mouse, the mouse died. The other strain of the Streptococcus pneumoniae that he had had no capsule. So the R stands for rough. So when he looked at these under the microscope, they had a rough appearance on the outside edge of them. So the strain, the 2R strain that he had was non-pathogenic. So when he took these unencapsulated cells or bacteria, I should say, and injected them into a mouse, the mouse's immune system handled them no problem. Right. So <clears throat> he did a couple of things. So he what? So let's see, how should I do this? So let's look at what he did. He took the, the next step that he took is he took the encapsulated cells. So these cells that have the capsule, the three S strain, and he treated them with heat to kill them. So he basically autoclaved these bacteria and injected them into a mouse. And of course, this had no effect because the bacteria were dead. So what did he do next? This is what he did that was really, I think, is pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, of course, not not so interesting for the mouse. But he took the he killed cells. So the dead bacteria that have a capsule and he took the living cells that didn't have a capsule and he mixed them together. And then he injected this mixture into a mouse. And not only did the mouse die, but when he took, when he basically took a sample of bacteria from the mouse, he saw that the bacteria that he took out most, mostly resembled the 3S pathogenic strain. And so I want you to pause here and pause the video and ask yourself a few questions. First of all, can you detect what the negative controls are, what the positive controls are, and what the experimental controls are? And then also I want you to draw a conclusion from this experiment. What does this experiment tell you? Or what can you, what, what, um, what assumptions can you make based on this experiment? So go ahead, pause the, pause this uh, video right here and then we'll talk about it. Okay. I really hope you paused the video. <laughs> so let's talk about it. Well, let's talk first about the controls. What is a negative control? Remember that a negative control is an experiment that you think you should get a negative result from or a no result for. And you can see that we have two of those results here. So he knew that the non-encapsulated cells are non-pathogenic. So he expected the mouse to live in this particular experiment. He also knew that dead bacteria cannot um, cannot be pathogenic because they're dead, of course, and injecting these into a mouse should give us no result at all. So these middle two experiments were our negative control. The top experiment, of course, is our positive control. He needed to prove that, of course, the strep pneumonia strain itself was in fact pathogenic, that it was capable of killing a mouse when injected as a live, whole, healthy bacteria. So we have our positive controls, we, our positive control, we have our two negative control, and of course, our two negative controls, and of course, our last, um, our last group here is our experimental control. This is the experiment that we didn't know how it would turn out. Now, we have to be very careful about what conclusion we can draw here, because there could be a few conclusions. So something, for example, um, I remember last semester a student said, well, maybe these bacteria, the unencapsulated bacteria, are just stealing the capsule. Like maybe they can somehow slip in and, you know, it's almost like stealing someone's winter coat or something. They can, they can just take the capsule away from the dead bacteria. Uh, that's one possibility. Um, another possibility, of course, is that they're taking, they're taking something, right? They're taking some aspect from these dead bacteria and they're using it to, because we know that these bacteria, for example, we know that these bacteria had to come from the 2R strain. There's no way that they could not because these can't reproduce. But we have to, they had to have some way of getting that capsule. And it was a mystery for a really long time. No one could really explain how the, um, the 2R strain basically transformed into looking like the 3S strain. 
So to address this a little bit further, let's kind of narrow this down. We know that the three S cells have to be getting something, I'm sorry, must be giving something. So the dead cells, right, the dead bacteria must be giving the living to our strain something. They have to be taking up some characteristic of those dead cells, otherwise they wouldn't be able to encapsulate themselves. And there's really only four, um, oh, yeah, there's really only, I guess I should say, three candidates, um, proteins, polysaccharides, or um, um, nucleic acids, either RNA or DNA. And so we're going to look at a video that kind of introduces the next step in this experiment, and then we'll talk about why and how we know that DNA is the transforming principle. So let me grab the, the video here. I'm going to skip ahead just a little bit over the unimportant part. Let me make sure you guys get everything in your screen here. And we're good. Oh, you know what? I bet, I bet I don't have, I bet I don't have the um, computer audio set up. Hold on. Okay, sorry about that. I needed to, if you see a little blip in the video, I had to stop and restart the video because I didn't have my computer audio on. So we're gonna watch this little video together and then we'll discuss the results. By Frederick Griffith in 1928. Griffith found that if a virulent strain of pneumococcus bacteria, known as the 3S strain, was heat killed, mixed with live pneumococcus bacteria of the non-virulent 2R strain, and injected into mice, some of the R bacteria were transformed into living infectious 3S bacteria, which killed the mice. In addition, all descendants of the transformed bacteria were also infectious. Griffith knew that some component of the heat-killed S cells was responsible for this genetic change, but he did not know which one. He called the unknown agent the transforming principle. After Griffith published his findings, Avery and his colleagues set out to find the identity of the transforming principle. Okay, so I'm going to pause it here and let's just kind of quick review. So, so the so the video just reviewed what we had just talked about, the famous Griffith experiment that shows that um, unencapsulated cells can take on that capsule inside a mouse. And now the hunt is on for that transforming principle. What, what is it? Is it DNA? Is it protein? Is it carbohydrates? We um, need to know. And the Avery experiment, this next experiment, the Avery and McLeod experiments are going to try to determine what this transforming principle is. All right, so let's continue. First, First, they broke open, they broke or lysed, heat-killed 3S bacteria, heat bacteria with a detergent, releasing the contents, releasing the of, the contents of the cells. Then, they, then used, a they used a centrifuge to separate the cellular the contents, the cellular known contents, as the cell extract, cell from the cellular debris. The cellular debris. To make sure that the extract sure contained the transforming contained principle, the, principle extract the extract was mixed with a culture of living 2R bacteria. bacteria. Then the mixture was then incubated was and plated incubated on a petri dish. On a petri dish. Colonies of 3S Colonies bacteria, of 3S appeared, bacteria on appeared on the plate, indicating that the 2R bacteria had been transformed. Avery and his colleagues now, now his knew that one of the components of the extract, polysaccharides, proteins, DNA, or RNA, was responsible for the transformation, so they developed a method to isolate and test each one for its ability to transform bacteria. First, the extract was mixed with an enzyme called S3 to remove the polysaccharides. A sample of the treated extract was then mixed with 2R bacteria, incubated, and plated on a petri dish. 3S colonies appeared on the plate, indicating that the transformation... So again, so let's just, sorry, I hope I'm not annoying you by <laughs> pausing the video, but they took, and again, the, the mechanism necessarily of this, um, the mechanism doesn't necessarily matter um, in this experiment too much. I really want you to get the idea of what they did. So they took this transforming the pool that they know has the transforming, uh, the transforming principle in it, and they treated this pool with something that will remove all the polysaccharides. So this um, enzyme, I think that they added to it, destroyed any polysaccharides that were available 
in this mixture. And they saw that this mixture was still able to transform the unencapsulated bacteria. And had taken place even without the presence of polysaccharides. Therefore, polysaccharides could not be the transforming principle. Next, the extract was treated with protease enzyme, which digested the proteins. A sample of the protease treated extract was then tested to see if it still contained the transforming principle. Once again, 3S colonies appeared on the plate, showing that proteins could not transform bacteria. Since both polysaccharides and proteins had been removed from the extract, the remaining extract contained only the nucleic acids DNA and RNA. To test each nucleic acid independently, Avery and his colleagues used enzymes known as nucleases. First, they used RNAs to break down the RNA in the extract. A sample of the RNAs treated extract was then tested. As before, the presence of 3S colonies on the plate proved that RNA was not the transforming principle. So again, just to recap, we've now eliminated three of the... I know you guys are in huge suspense right now because you know it's DNA, <laughs> but they've taken taken out the polysaccharides as a candidate, they've removed proteins as a possibility in this mixture, and then they treated this mixture with RNA, it's basically an enzyme that destroys RNA to remove the possibility that RNA is the candidate enzyme or the candidate um, transforming principle as well. So we know that the only thing that's left, of course, is DNA. Finally, a sample of the nucleic acid mixture Finally, was treated with DNAs to destroy the DNA. After incubation with 2R bacteria, the sample was plated. This time, no 3S colonies appeared on the plate. Because the transforming principle was destroyed when DNA was removed from the extract, Avery and his colleagues concluded that the transforming principle must be DNA. Great, so I'll pause the video there. You can watch the end of it on your own. But, but again, the take home from the Avery experiment, of course, is that DNA must be the transforming principle um, as proven by the Avery, and uh, this is called the Avery and McLeod experiment. So uh, two very famous experiments. First, the Griffith experiment that showed um, encapsulated cells in mice, and then the Avery experiment showing that the transforming principle, let me go back, whoops, let me go back to this slide really quick. The, the transforming principle that these dead cells were giving the living cells to allow them to make a capsule were of course the genes that encode for all the proteins that you need to make that capsule. So the Avery experiment showed that DNA was in fact that transforming principle. So as kind of a head nod to the original term that Griffith gave to that trans, they, again, he called it the transforming principle, we now call this method of DNA uptake transformation because of the original term that Griffith used when he did his experiments. So what actually is transformation? So transformation, and it's very simple, like a very simple phrase to describe it, is the, the, the take up of what we call naked DNA. And when I say naked DNA, essentially what I mean is it's it's just DNA. There's nothing else to it. It's real. It's literally like floating around in the media outside of the bacteria. So it's not encased in a nucleus. It doesn't have proteins associated with it. It's really just kind of hanging out in space. And this actually happens all the time. When bacteria die, they basically break open and the contents of their insides spill out into the open. So when bacteria are living like out in the real world, like in our mouth or in our intestines or in a mud puddle, there's a whole mixture of contents that they have at their outside in their in their surroundings and a lot of times they have like the dead the the guts of their dead brethren surrounding them <laughs> in the in the in the media as well so what happens here is so the, they have a neighboring cell die their dna um uh, that dead bacteria that dna can get chopped up by these endonucleases these enzymes and that spills out into the environment. And so certain bacteria, not all bacteria can do this, certain bacteria um, that are also in the area can actually take up that DNA and bring it into their, uh, in, into the inside of their own, uh, inside of the bacteria itself. So this requires, an, a bacteria that is able to do this is called competent. 
So a, a competent bacteria has competence factors, and those factors are usually like the, the enzyme, the, the protein complexes that span the cell membrane and the cell wall that are basically able to take in this DNA um, um, and um, process it in a way that this bacteria can, can use it. So in this particular example, we have a piece of DNA, and this piece of DNA happens to code for resistance to an antibiotic called streptomycin. So this bacteria is sensitive to streptomycin. Why isn't my, my, um, my mouse isn't working very well? Probably because I have it on a shiny surface. Let's see, is that better? Good, okay, that's much better. So this particular bacteria is sensitive to streptomycin. And you can see that there's a little piece of DNA that's hanging out in the environment that is resistant. It codes for a gene that would convey resistance to streptomycin. So this little piece of DNA is going to get processed and brought into the competent cell. And you can see that this process actually makes it single-stranded. And the single-stranded piece of DNA is going to recombine with the bacteria's chromosome. And this recombination process, the mechanism, uh, the mechanism is called homologous recombination, but don't get too caught up in, in the mechanism it's, itself. So when this parent cell divides, only one of the daughter cells is going to get that gene. And now if we were to plate these bacteria on media that contain streptomycin, only this daughter cell, only this particular daughter cell will survive because it's resistant to streptomycin, whereas this daughter cell will, um, of course, die because it's sensitive to streptomycin. So let's look at a quick video, a quick animation that shows transformation in action. I just wanna make sure we're still rolling and we are, okay, good. DNA a transformation involves the transfer of naked DNA into a DNA. recipient cell. In the first step, double-stranded donor, donor DNA binds to specific receptors receptor on the surface of a competent cell. Step, one strand of the donor DNA is degraded by nucleases while the other strand enters the cell. One strand of the the single-stranded donor, donor DNA pairs with an homologous region on the recipient the DNA and is integrated into the recipient genome by a breakage and reunion mechanism called homologous recombination. If there are any differences between the nucleotide sequences of the donor and recipient DNAs, the mismatch repair system comes into play. The repair system removes either the donor or the recipient strand and replaces it with the complementary sequence. Since either strand may be repaired, some cells contain the new donor DNA and others have the original DNA sequences. In the laboratory, cells are plated on selective media so that only the transformants will grow. In the laboratory, cells are plated on selective media so that only the transformants will grow. All right. So we can see transformation in action. So that, that animation showed an example that used ampicillin as the antibiotic of choice. This particular, I think this is a right out of your book. It shows, can you guys hear my phone? This is ridiculous. I swear this is not normal. Oh, again, I got to put it on silent. Hold on. Oh my God. Ring volume, right? Won't be down, done. Okay. <clears throat> so this is transformation. Let me go full screen here really quick just to kind of wrap this up. So our first example of recombination and introducing genetic variation is this process of taking up naked DNA, again, just DNA on its own, into a bacteria. And as you can imagine, this is a major mechanism of um, antibiotic resistance in bacteria in um, a wild type situation. So in a body, um, for example, you've all heard, of course, of antibiotic resistance, resistance popping up in um, uh, bacterial infections. And this is a major mechanism of gaining that antibiotic resistance. So if a bacteria dies, its DNA gets chopped up. And, uh, you know, it, it, again, think about the chances of this actually happening there, you know, it's one in a billion. But remember that when we talk, when we talk about even a very, very small bacterial sample, you have billions and billions of bacteria in that bacteria 
bacteria sample. So it's going to happen, and all you need is that one bacteria to double every 20 minutes, and very soon within a matter of days, you're going to have a huge amount of bacteria that contain this antibiotic resistance gene. All right, so the next lecture, I'm gonna end this lecture here, um, but the next lecture we're gonna start with generali generalized transduction. Oh, did I get it?